We're living in interesting times. We're living in times when a majority of people in our country are very defensive about the Bible. They want every step to be taken to promote it and to encourage people to read it. In fact, there are some who want to declare our nation a Christian nation based on their reading of the scriptures. However, recent polls have shown that hardly anybody reads the Bible anymore. The vast majority of people in our country do not read the Bible ever. Some read it maybe once a month or some even once a week or they read in it, they dip here and there, they pull up a passage and study that and thank goodness even that much is done. But the greatest complaint among church going people is that they do not understand the Bible on which their faith is based. Well, today we're going to try to take a swing at that and see if we can at least improve our own understandings of Scripture based on the book of Matthew, taking Matthew itself as the object of our study. I'd like to welcome you to 80 A.D. 80 A.D. Because that's the approximate time when the book of, of Matthew appeared. But what was going on in the world in 80 A.D.? What was happening? Well, in Rome, four emperors had either been assassinated or taken their own lives, and there was a vacancy at the top. So the political and legal aspects of the time were in jeopardy or certainly in question. The general who had conquered Jerusalem, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that in around 70 AD, the Roman army sacked the, the city of Jerusalem, burned it to the ground, terrorized it, killed many of its citizens, drove out the rest, persecuted the Christians, killed James, the brother of John, who was the head of the Jerusalem church, and many of, of the uh, people in that congregation fled north to the city of Antioch. But Rome had desecrated Jerusalem, and the city was no more, and worse, the temple was no more. The temple was razed to the ground. The Sadducees had no more place to work or to claim any position of authority because their position of authority depended on a building which was leveled to the ground. So the Sadducees and the kind of sacrificial religion that they stood for and benefited from were gone. The Pharisees were left and they were having a meeting in a city on the coast to try to understand what could be resurrected from the Jewish faith by them, if anything. And what they decided upon was that they should shift from a, an emphasis upon temple worship to synagogue, the synagogues as the center of Jewish worship and to shift the focus away from sacrifices at the temple to obeying the Mishnah and the Talmud and the law, therefore, of Moses. So those shifts were happening religiously and people were uprooted. Some moved uh, north to Turkey, some moved north to Syria and reestablished their homes in a new place. It was a difficult time. It was a time of great movement. It was also a time when the Christian message was confused. There was no agreement about what the message of Jesus was. 
but there were many Jesus followers. These Jesus followers had bits and pieces of the Jesus story. Some could tell you the birth story or a birth story. They weren't in agreement on that. Some could tell you the crucifixion story. Some could tell you a little bit about the Sermon on the Mount. Some knew one or two of the Beatitudes, and some told other stories about Jesus. Some told this wild story that we read today, a weird story of the disciples in the boat, where they felt safe at least, where they were, in a stormy sea, and they saw Jesus walking on the water, the story itself is uh, amazing, a very, a, a very strange story. But it didn't seem strange to the people of the day because miracles and strange uh, happenings were familiar to the people at the time. The Greeks had a hero that they referred to, uh, escape. escape if I can say it correctly here, and I can't. Anyway, he, he was a Greek physician who was said to do wonder working in healing people. The Romans had their own hero, someone named Pythagoras, who told salvation stories. And even the Egyptians had their wonder worker, Isis, who was supposedly one who could work miracles around tales of what is true. And the Jews had Elisha, their own hero, who was said to have raised the dead. So it was not unusual for someone to be a miracle worker. And in the story we heard read today, Jesus was that miracle worker. So some told that story, but there were bits and pieces of the gospel floating around and told as stories by different people who had a hold on different parts of the life of Jesus. So this was the world that Matthew lived in. This was the world coming apart, Rome leaderless, strange behavior among the leaders of, uh, of the Jews, the temple gone, the Sadducees gone, the Pharisees rewriting and reorganizing the way Judaism should be followed. All of this was happening and Christians dispersed, fleeing for their lives to get away from the Romans. In 65 AD or about that time, both Peter and Paul were executed by the Romans in Rome under Nero, who was the emperor at the time. So some of the leaders that they did know in Antioch were gone. All of the eyewitnesses, those who had actually known Jesus, were gone. So what was left? Well, bits and pieces. People had bits and pieces. And Matthew decided that what he could do to help the church was to try to bring those bits and pieces together into one story. So let's look at Matthew's story. Will you take the Bible that's in your pews, please? and turn to the Gospel of Matthew. It's in the New Testament, the first book in the New Testament. You'll find it there, waiting for you. The first part of Matthew contains the infancy stories, but it goes all the way back to Abraham before it begins with the stories all the way back to Abraham as the founder, the father of Judaism, and it starts to work its way forward. The birth stories as told by Jesus 
are quite different from the ones found in the Gospel of Luke. There are no birth stories in either the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Mark, but only in Matthew and Luke, and they tell two different stories. But the, but the story in Matthew is of Jesus fleeing, having to flee for his life because Herod, the king at the time, was killing, slaughtering the babies in, in uh, Bethlehem. He wanted to avoid any competition at all. And so Matthew gives us this story of the flight of Jesus and his parents to Egypt. We have no idea how long they stayed there, but in chapters 1 and 2 to chapter 222, we have the infancy stories. Matthew then goes on from that, but he jumps 20 years at least into the future. He gives us no stories of Jesus as a young boy running around Nazareth or as a teenager getting into trouble in Nazareth. No stories at all about Jesus and his growing up years, what he was like, what the boy Jesus was like, what he went through, what the family life was like, nothing. We have no stories at all, just a big vacancy in Matthew about those early years. But when Jesus does come on the scene again, he's with John the Baptist at the Jordan River. So the story picks up or actually is initiated by the story of Jesus with John the Baptist, where he is baptized by John and where a dove flies down and rests upon him, symbolizing God choosing him or announcing him as the Messiah. And that is Matthew's main point, picked up again and again in the gospel. Jesus is God. Jesus reveals God. If you want to know what God is like, Here's the man to look at, Jesus. Everything he says and everything he does points to God, points to the kingdom that God desires among human beings. And so from the beginning, even before the beginning of his public ministry, while with John and at his baptism, Jesus is revealed to us as the Son of God. At his baptism, Matthew reports one of the stories of the time that a voice spoke from heaven and God said, this is my Son. Wow, what a story. Well, we move from John and Jesus together into Jesus' early teachings. Matthew does a great favor for us, or whoever wrote Matthew, whether it was one person or several, whoever wrote this book and gave it to us took all of the teachings, the major teachings of Jesus at least, and combined them into five great messages. And they start with chapter 5 and what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. So the story, the tale that Matthew is telling continues with the, with the sermons and the teachings of Jesus. Here we find the Beatitudes. Here we find Jesus' great teaching about peace and about the kingdom and about right relations among his followers. So the story continues with the great messages of teaching, uh, the great teachings of Jesus. These continue in the book of Matthew until chapter 9 through Matthew 9, where we change the subject now, and Matthew introduces us to the 12. 
Jesus' calling of the 12 disciples. Why 12? Well, because there were 12 tribes of Israel and Jesus was reenacting the Jewish story of the 12 tribes and God expressing his will and his way through those tribes and the stories they tell. So we move through that passage of the calling, the, the part of the scriptures of Matthew where we see the calling of the disciples and we move quickly into the parables of Jesus. Once again, whoever wrote Matthew combined things, brought the teachings together and brought the parables together. So beginning in, with uh, chapter 13 in Matthew, where we're now about halfway through the gospel, we see all the, the parables are brought together. One after another, these parables are told and we continue through Matthew on to the forming of the disciples, the forming of them as a community of people who would carry on the message and the teachings of Jesus. We find this, including the sending of the disciples out to do the very things that Jesus was doing in healing and teaching and preaching. We find this, in beginning in chapter 14, and it includes the passage that was read today, Jesus' forming of the disciples. It's no accident that Matthew puts the disciples themselves, the 12, in a boat, because the boat early on became the symbol of the church. Antioch in the north, the city where Matthew did his writing, the city of, of uh, Antioch was the first place that the word Christian was introduced to refer to the Jesus followers. And it was the first place that the word church or ecclesia was used to refer to the gathering of those disciples into some kind of an identifiable body. So here we find the coming together of the disciples or the church itself in the midst of this wonder that Jesus worked. It's no wonder that the storm ceased as soon as Jesus entered the boat. The storm was raging. Jesus entered the boat. It was a safe place. The storm stopped. The disciples now were safe. They could make their way to the land because Jesus had saved them. Well, we think today still that the church is a place where we come together and meet Jesus and the storms around us can cease because Jesus reminds us that he is in charge and even the winds and the waves obey him. Great power, the power of God. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Matthew's key point all through, Jesus reveals God. We're getting close to the end of the story as Jesus heads for Jerusalem, beginning with chapter 23, I'm sorry, beginning with chapter 12 um, to chapter 20, we get his travel to Jerusalem and his arrival there. Following that, Matthew gives us a very careful story about Jesus in the temple and Jesus in the city of Jerusalem, what he goes through, what he says, what he does, and what the disciples do also while he is there. This is followed in Matthew by the Passover meal, the last supper that we celebrated last week, the breaking of the bread, the passing of the wine, his body, 
his blood. The final section of Matthew tells the story of Jesus' final arrest, his trial before the Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities, finally his crucifixion, his terrible suffering, which reveals that God is with us even in our worst pain, that God is with us and suffers with us. His crucifixion is death and his resurrection. All of those bring Matthew to a close. And so we've gone through the book. You now have a book that you can describe to other people and say, I know a little about Matthew. It's an amazing story told by an amazing writer who had the ability to pick up this story and that story and that one and that one and bring them together into a rational publication that became cherished and still is cherished by the church. We're struck by it. We're influenced by it. Matthew continues to speak to us. I'd like you to turn, if you would, please, to chapter 5 in Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5, beginning with verse 3. And see if these words don't have meaning for you today. Chapter 5 beginning with verse three. It said, Jesus started his sermon with these words, describing the life inside the church. Blessed, would you read it with me, please? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Be joyous and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven for so in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amazing writing, wonderful sentiment, the teachings of Jesus, the word of God for us. Amen.